all of you. Um, and it does look like around 68% of us are somewhat familiar with these climate projections and around a quarter of us are very familiar. So that's really great for me to know since we'll be covering some of this information today. All right, so I'm gonna launch right in here. So yes, yeah, so I put a link to the workshop materials in the chat box. Um, I encourage you to download those. Um, if you don't wanna download the whole folder, if you could make sure that you've downloaded the Word version of the Climate Smart Restoration Worksheet. That would be very helpful since we'll be filling that out as part of our breakout group activities. So before I launch into my presentation, um, I wanted to start by providing some background on my organization, Point Blue Conservation Science. Um, so we were founded in 1965 as the Point Reyes Bird Observatory. Um, and we have a background in bird conservation, monitoring and research. Um, and our mission is to conserve birds, other wildlife, and their ecosystems through science, partnerships, and outreach. Uh, we work um, internationally, primarily in California, but also in Antarctica and uh, with other partners internationally on bird conservation and uh, ecosystem conservation as well. Right now, our strategic goal is to increase the pace and scale of climate smart conservation and restoration. So all the work that we do, we do through this lens of climate change, whether it's climate change adaptation, uh, trying to reduce impacts from climate change, as well as climate change mitigation. So trying to find ways to uh, manage land and ecosystems for increased carbon uh, sequestration. And so because we're focused on really increasing the pace and scale of our work, uh, we do a lot of workshops like the one today um, we work extensively with partners on different projects to make sure that we're really sharing our knowledge and learning from others about how to do this uh, conservation work uh, under these rapidly changing climate conditions. So our target for the workshop today is to learn how to use Point Blue's climate smart restoration framework to inform the planning and design of riparian revegetation projects. So in terms of our objectives, uh, by the end of the workshop, hopefully you will have learned how to first assess climate vulnerabilities in the context of restoration goals and targets for riparian revegetation projects in particular. And also I'll be walking you through a process. Um, so hopefully by the end of the workshop, you will have an idea of how to develop a climate smart planting palette for riparian revegetation projects based on climate adaptive plant traits. So in terms of our agenda for today, um, first I'll give a background on what we mean by that term, climate smart restoration. We'll review the climate projections for the Southwestern US as a basis for our work today. Um, and then we'll spend the majority of the workshop going through the steps to develop a climate smart planting palette. So we'll learn and practice how to identify climate vulnerabilities to riparian vegetation. And then we'll use those climate vulnerabilities to identify plant traits and other restoration strategies that can help address those vulnerabilities. We'll end with a demo of a climate smart planting palette tool uh, that I developed for Sierra Nevada wet meadows. And throughout the presentation, I'll show about how these tools can be used in riparian revegetation projects. If you have any questions throughout the workshop, please feel free to add them to the chat box. I have a few. Um, sections in this workshop today where I'll pause and ask for questions. So we will take some breaks periodically to do that as well. So launching right in here, um, I think it's really important for us first to discuss why we're thinking about climate change and restoration and why that's an important thing for us to be doing. So we're all doing riparian and wetland restoration efforts um, within the context of a rapidly changing climate. And we're already seeing shifting baselines in our local climate and our ecosystems, um, such as decreasing snowpack and increases in extreme events like wildfire and drought. Traditional approaches to restoration usually focus on restoring to a historic baseline condition of the ecosystem or restoring back to what we consider a present day reference condition for that ecosystem. However, this approach might not be sufficient to ensure resilience given climate change because the past might not actually be the best guide to a future functioning state. So the conditions of the past that we might be using as a reference condition might not be suitable for thinking through the life cycle of our projects and realizing that we want these restored ecosystems 
to continue providing the benefits um, and the functions that we're hoping they will uh, in the future under climate change. So we need to make sure that our restoration projects are climate smart. So at Point Blue, we, def we define climate smart ecological restoration as the process of enhancing the ecological function of degraded or destroyed areas in a manner that prepares them for the consequences of climate change and achieves multiple benefits. So what this definition means in practice, uh, it means setting forward-looking goals in the context of climate projections rather than trying to restore to a historic or even a present day baseline reference condition. It also requires understanding and coping with uncertainty so that we have projects that are likely to succeed under multiple possible futures. I think one of the hesitations that practitioners might have with uh, climate change adaptation efforts is that there is uncertainty about how the climate change is going to change depending on how the global community responds to it and also just uncertainty inherent in some of our climate models. So this can sometimes be a barrier for practitioners to integrate climate change into their projects. But I really hope um, in today's presentation, we'll talk about how to cope with that uncertainty and uh, find ways to integrate that uncertainty into our projects as well. So what are the climate projections that we need to be paying attention to when designing climate smart restoration projects? So I'm going to provide a really brief overview of some of the climate projections that might be relevant to our riparian revegetation projects. Um, I'm going to run through a few slides here. This isn't a comprehensive list of the climate projections. So if you think of any that I haven't captured, please feel free to put those in the chat box. Um, and so since the majority of you are from the Southwest, I looked at the list of who has signed up, um, and this conference is focused on riparian habitat in the southwestern U.S., I am going to focus on these projections for today. Um, so I know that some of you might not be in this region, but I hope for the purposes of today's workshop, we can just make assumptions based on these projections for our activities. So the figure here shows the projected temperature increases uh, in the southwestern U United States during different periods in the 21st century. So in our top row here, shows projections under a higher emission scenario. So this is roughly similar to what we're currently on track to achieve given the relative lack of serious mitigation efforts by the global community. This bottom row shows our projections if we have a lower emission scenario, such as if we actually um, meet the targets of the Paris Climate Accord. So under this higher emission scenario, we can expect temperatures to increase in this region by 2.5 to 5.5 degrees Fahrenheit by mid-century, which is this middle figure here, and 6.5 to 7.5 degrees Fahrenheit by late century. So as we have these rising temperatures, that means we're going to have hotter and drier conditions overall. And that means decreased soil moisture and also decreased water available for ecosystems, plants, wildlife and people. So these rising temperatures are dri driving a lot of the changes we can expect to see in our riparian ecosystems. We're also going to see an increase in the frequency, intensity, and duration of extreme events which may interact with and exacerbate one another. So I'm sure all of you have experienced either firsthand or uh, are aware of these types of extreme events that are happening in the present day. So we're going to see inc increased frequency of wildfires and an increase in the acres burned annually. And the wildfire season might also lengthen. So I'm based in California and I read an article recently that our winter precipitation season is occurring later and later, which means this wildfire season is just extending even longer. We're also going to be experiencing longer and hotter heat waves and increased drought frequency, intensity, and length. And of course, these things can all interact with one another. So drought can interact with these overstocked forests that are fire suppressed, leading to tree mortality, which in turn could lead to bark beetle outbreaks and foot forests and more risks for wildfire. So these are all interacting and exacerbating one another. And then finally, I wanted to highlight changes to hydrology from climate change, which I think has the most serious implications for riparian restoration projects in particular. So as we're having these rising temperatures in the winter and spring months, 
uh, we're going to observe a shift in our precipitation from snow to rain in our winter season. We'll also expect to see a changing precipitation patterns. So in the southern part of this region, we're projected to experience reduced winter and spring precipitation. And in the northern part of this region, we might see this continued interannual variability in precipitation. So there is a little bit of uncertainty about how precipitation patterns might change, but there is a really increased, uh, really high probability that we're going to be seeing more rain than snow. So because we might be seeing more rain than snow, we could have events where we have rain falling on snow leading to increased winter flood events from these rain on snow high flow events. These warming temperatures and more rain will also lead to reduction in snow water equivalent. So this figure shows the, the projected amount of snow water equivalent in each southwestern state in the early, mid, and late 21st century relative to a baseline from the late 20th century, which is in this dark red as our baseline. So as the temperatures warm, we will see a shift in uh, snowpack. We're going to be seeing decreased snowpack. And we're also going to be seeing earlier spring snow melt. So the timing of when we have snow melt running off from these high mountain ranges is going to shift earlier and earlier into the year. So as we have this shift in peak runoff, we're also going to might we might also be seeing longer periods in the drier summer months where we have low flow in our streams and rivers. So this means changes in stream flow timing and the amount of water we have and when water is available, which has a lot of implications for our riparian ecosystem. So we, before we move on to the next section, I just want to pause and see if there are any questions about what I've presented thus far or any comments in the chat box. I haven't seen anything come in just yet. Okay, great. Then I can carry on. All right, so now that we have an understanding of the climate projections for the southwestern US, and we have this working definition of what we mean by climate smart restoration. So now we're going to spend the rest of the workshop uh, demonstrating a simple way to integrate climate change into riparian revegetation projects through a climate smart planting palette approach. So we're going to dive really deep into riparian revegetation practices in particular. So revegetation is a really important component of riparian restoration projects. And so I know that in some cases, revegetation can might, might be the main action in riparian restoration projects. That's the main thing that we're restoring for. Um, whereas riparian revegetation might complement other restoration activities, or it might even be overlooked. So in the wet meadow ecosystems that I work in, uh, we often focus on restoring the hydrology of the system, and if revegetation does occur, it might be with a small suite of species like willows and sedge mats. Um, so revegetation can really run the gamut of being a big focus of these projects to maybe an afterthought or, or something that we don't spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, but revegetation is really important because it can help us reach multiple project goals, such as increased biodiversity and ecosystem function. And it can also help confer resiliency to the restored ecosystem and also increase adaptive capacity of our ecological communities. So for example, planting riparian shrubs can create habitat for nesting birds. These shrubs could provide flowers and fruit for insects and wildlife. And shrubs along the stream can also provide cover for fish through dense vegetation and root wads and also help recruit some woody debris into the stream channel. So in this way, riparian vegetation can really help at all levels of our, our trophic uh, food webs from insects to fish to birds to other wildlife. Revegetation can also help restore ecosystem functions. So riparian vegetation can help capture sediment, uh, stabilize stream banks, and help with erosion control. And it could also help us confer site resiliency. So for example, uh, planting high densities of native plants that are early colonizers and really competitive might help prevent invasive species from establishing at a newly restored site that might have experienced some disturbance from restoration activities. 
So that could be really important strategy as the climate changes and we might be experiencing a greater expansion of invasive species. So we can strategize around how we can use riparian revegetation to our benefit to help alleviate and respond to some climate vulnerability. And of course, um, planting riparian shrubs and trees and other plants can also help mitigate climate change by helping to store carbon. So the idea here uh, is that we can try and design how we're doing revegetation projects to help address climate vulnerabilities to our restored ecological communities and help increase adaptive to capacity as well. So Point Blue has developed a climate smart planting palette approach to help practitioners find a way to integrate climate change considerations into their projects. So we've developed several planting palette tools um, and the purpose of these tools is to help inform riparian revegetation projects to increase the adaptive capacity of the restored ecological community. So in particular, um, these tools help practitioners evaluate and select plants that have specific traits that may help these plants better survive, recruit, and provide co-benefits under a changing climate. So this is just a brief overview of some of the planting palette tools that we have already created for wetland and riparian areas in California. So we've developed um, several tools for riparian areas of coastal California, specific to counties um, north and south of the San Francisco Bay area. We also have a tool for the marsh upland transition zone in tidal wetlands of the San Francisco and San Pablo Bay in California. And most recently, just last year, I created a planting palette tool for uh, wet meadows in the Sierra Nevada range of California, which is my study site. So our project team at Point Blue has done extensive work piloting and experimenting with the tool for riparian areas and the transition zone in the San Francisco Bay area. So we've got a lot of experience working in these systems and using these tools. And because I just developed this tool for Sierra Meadows and what was the COVID pandemic, we haven't yet had a chance to pilot the tool, but we do have several projects lined up that will be implemented over the next few years where I will be testing and refining the Climate Smart Planting Palette tool for those wet meadow ecosystems. All of these tools are freely available to download at Point Blue's website, and I've included the link here at the bottom of the screen. So for the rest of the presentation, I, in the workshop today, I'm going to walk us through steps to develop your own Climate Smart Planting Palette tool. So the real benefit of our approach is that it's easy, easily replicable uh, and can be cultivated and, and uh, it's flexible enough that you can design a similar product for your own ecosystem or target geography. So there are four general steps that we use to develop our planting palette tools. So the first step is to develop an initial species list. So the idea here is to create a really lengthy list of all possible species you might consider including in a riparian revegetation project. The next step is to identify climate vulnerabilities to riparian revegetation. So this involves looking at climate projections for your given uh, ecosystem and region and thinking through how those vulnerabilities might impact your restoration site. Once you have an understanding of these climate vulnerabilities and you have an idea of the type of other goals you might want to achieve through riparian revegetation, uh, the next step would be to select and evaluate plant traits that can help reduce the vulnerabilities you've identified and meet other project goals. And finally, uh, the last step is to use the tool to develop a climate smart planting palette design for your own project. And so we're gonna go through each of these steps so that you can learn how to develop a tool for your own target geography and ecosystem. And we've developed these tools in an Excel database and have a corresponding user guide that includes information on our methods and our data sources and a suggested approach about how you can use the tool for your own work. Uh, so, so throughout this presentation, I'm going to pull up the database tool I developed for Sierra Meadows, 
so you can see what it actually looks like in practice. And these steps are all, all outlined in the uh, one of the handouts that I provided in the box folder. So you'll have a reference to take home with you today. So our first step in designing these climate smart planting palette tools is to create a species list. So we really recommend generating a really large list of locally occurring species suitable for restoration of your target ecosystem in your given geography. And so what we're trying to do is create a really big list of plant species that you can then take and filter every time you have a project that requires a planting palette. So you're not gonna use every single species and every single planting design, um, but you wanna have a really large and diverse list of species that you could tailor pick and choose from these species for a given project. So for example, my Sierra Meadow planting palette tool has 70 species in it, including grasses, forbs, shrubs, and trees. So you can generate your local species list um, by consulting with botanists and other restoration practitioners to identify appropriate species to include. You can also look at reference ecosystems to see which species are, are occurring in your given riparian areas that you're trying to restore. And one thing that I did in developing my tool was to develop and apply specific criteria to help identify which species I wanted to include. So criteria could be species that are riparian associated, occur in your target geography. Um, you could include species that are more broadly distributed or common, um, which is something that I recommend in particular because more broadly distributed species might be better able to cope with climate as it changes. Um, if you're focusing on more endemic or rare species, um, those are going to require more consideration because they might be more vulnerable to climate change just because they might have a more restricted range. So the purpose for, of our tool here is to try and enhance that ecological adaptive capacity. So I'd really recommend looking at these more common and broadly distributed species that might actually do okay with climate change. Um, you might also want to make sure that you're representing multiple functional groups. So as I mentioned, having a mix of forbs and shrubs and trees and grasses. Sometimes in riparian restoration projects, we might get fo really focused on willows and exclude other species. Um, that happens in my meadow projects a lot. So thinking through multiple functional groups can be a good way to try and increase that biodiversity. And I also recommend um, selecting species based on the ease of acquiring plant materials. So when I was selecting species for my Sierra Meadow tool, um, I looked at uh, websites for nurseries in my area to make sure that um, certain plant materials are accessible. Uh, I also thought about um, seed collection and propagation and, and things like that uh, in terms of which species I wanted to include. So I'm not going to include species that are really difficult to grow out or might be hard to harvest materials from. So those species are the ones that I excluded from the tool. So once you have the criteria and you've got a working list, um, you can develop a list of these locally occurring species that meet the criteria. So I'm going to stop this PowerPoint for a second and pull up my planting palette tool. Um, are we seeing my this Excel spreadsheet? I want to make sure everything's working. I'm going to yes. assume that it is. Yes. Great. <laughs> I've got two screens going, so I just want to make sure everything is squared away. Um, so this is our Sierra Meadow planting palette tool. And there's a couple of tabs here along the bottom that I'll be going through today. Um, but I just wanted to show the species list that I came up with really briefly here. So under this plant selection tab in the tool, I've got a list of all the species I've included. So I've got 70 species in this state tool database. And I've got a lot of information about these species so that practitioners can decide what's appropriate to include. So I've got the functional group here. I've got elevation range. Uh, I've got the bioregion in which these species in, uh, occurs, so people can filter by their area within the Sierra Nevada. And then I've listed the habitat type that these species are associated with. So I've got wet meadows, mesic meadows, 
dry meadows, and the riparian zone. So you can use all of these different criteria to help figure out which species you might want to include for your given project site. And I also have the wetland indicator status, um, which can also help figure out both which species to include and also where to plant them at your riparian restoration site. So you might want to do facultative upland species along the edge where it's a little bit drier and then obligate species uh, in wetter areas of your project site. Let me close that and pull my presentation up again. All right, so the next step, so once you've got this list of species, um, what you want to do next is think through climate vulnerability to riparian vegetation. So we've already gone through some of the climate projections for the southwestern U.S. And now we want to take those projections and ask the question of how these projections might impact our goals for our riparian restoration and revegetation projects. In other words, we want to conduct a vulnerability assessment and generate climate vulnerabilities to our goals and targets. So the reason we're doing this is that once we understand the climate vulnerabilities, we can begin to select species treat values that we want to capture in our planting palette tool and restoration design. So this is all linking together. We've got our species we're selecting, our climate vulnerabilities, and then we'll think through how, plant how these plant traits might help reduce these vulnerabilities as well. So when I use the term climate vulnerability, um, some people may be familiar with this, others maybe not so much. Uh, so the definition of what we mean by this term um, is that a climate vulnerability is the susceptibility or amount of risk of a population or ecosystem to the negative impacts of climate change. And vulnerability is made up of three components, sensitivity, exposure, and adaptive capacity. So I'll go through each of these. So sensitivity refers to the intrinsic traits or characteristics of a species or system that might make it susceptible to climate change. So for example, um, this California golden trout species has a threshold water temperature tolerance of around 15 degrees Celsius, beyond which they may begin to experience stress or mortality. So that threshold temperature tolerance is a sensitivity of the species. It's an intrinsic trait of the species. Exposure refers to extrinsic factors that are driven by climate change. So that could be air and water temperatures, uh, changing hydrology, extreme events. Anything that is climate driven that's acting upon a species, a population, or a ecosystem. So in the example here with this California golden trout, um, this map here shows stream temperature projections in the golden trout wilderness of California. So these warmer colored streams show streams that might have warmer temperatures in the future, and the light blue areas might remain having cooler water temperature. So this map shows the exposure, potential exposure, of this California golden trout to these high stream temperatures. And the final component of vulnerability has to do with adaptive capacity. So adaptive capacity refers to the ability of a species or ecosystem to cope with climate change impacts. So for example, fish that are exposed to high stream temperatures could actually, you know, they're they're animals, they can move around, so they could actually migrate to streams or other aquatic refugia, cooler pools, that retain cooler water temperatures. So the adaptive capacity of this trout is its ability to migrate and disperse to other areas that might serve as refugia from these warmer temperatures. So to put this all together, you could say that a climate vulnerability of California golden trout is stress and mortality from warming stream temperatures. So in just a minute here, we'll first take a break for questions, and then we'll go into a breakout group activity about applying this concept of climate vulnerability. So since I wanted to provide some exam more examples of potential climate vulnerabilities to riparian habitats and vegetation. And so since we're focused today on riparian revegetation projects, 
I've included riparian vegetation as a potential goal here. And I've also included wildlife habitat as another goal or target. Since we know that these riparian vegetation projects can help provide wildlife habitat and wildlife habitat requires a healthy plant community. So we need both of these things. So just to give some more examples of vulnerability, um, if our restoration target is a healthy riparian vegetation community, uh, one vulnerability might be more frequent and intense droughts that lead to increased stress and mortality of riparian plants. So the climate production, the exposure we're talking about here are those more extreme droughts that we might experience. And this could lead to this increased stress and mortality of these plant species. So that would be the climate vulnerability here, one potential climate vulnerability. So vulnerability to wildlife habitat um, that's related to vegetation is that as the climate changes, as we're experiencing warmer temperatures in the spring and a shift in spring timing to earlier in the year, a uh, vulnerability from that could be a mismatch between the timing of resource availability provided by vegetation, such as fruits and flowers, and the timing of when wildlife are on the site taking advantage of those resources. So for example, I know a lot of you are from Colorado here today, so um, there's been a study in Colorado that shows that um, some nectar producing plants important to hummingbirds have shifted their phenology their bloom period to earlier in the year. And while migrating broad-tailed hummingbirds um, have also advanced their arrival to these places, they've shifted um, their arrival earlier in the year as well, um, but the hummingbirds are not keeping pace with um, the shift in timing of when these shrubs are blooming and providing these wildlife, these uh, nectar resources. So this shows a mismatch between the timing of when these plants are flowering and when the hummingbirds are arriving to take, um, to take advantage of those resources. So that was a lot of information. So I want to take a pause and see if there are any questions or comments before we get into our first breakout group activity. And I know that was a lot of information. <laughs> It looks like we have kind of more of a statement than question uh, from Lisa. She says, if you plant species that match future conditions, say drier conditions, but these conditions will not appear for several, several right. years, will the drought resistant plants survive the intermediate years where conditions may be wetter? That is an excellent question. Um, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. So the way that we've been thinking about this at Plain Blue is that First and foremost, we wanna be planting species that are going to do well currently at the site, right? That's the number one priority. And so for a lot of this involves some experimentation. So for some of these more drought tolerant, dry tolerant species, um, within my meadow, wet meadow ecosystem, the way I'm thinking about this is that I could plant some of those more drought tolerant or dry tolerant species along the meadow edge or at leading into the uplands. And so then if in the future, the meadow becomes more dry, maybe that meadow shifts to having more areas of dry meadow than wet meadow. Those species might, if they have established and are doing okay, they might have that opportunity to migrate in to that site that's become more dry. So you really need to think about the current site conditions, these different micro habitats and niches within um, the ecosystem you're restoring and make sure that you've got species that are gonna do well there today and also potentially experiment with including some species that might do well, you know, 50 years from now. Awesome. Um, the next question we have is, in developing your plant species list, where did you populate all of the attributes from? Yeah, so I used Calflora, which is, I, I'm based in California, so, we have a Calflora online database that has a lot of information about um, species distribution. And also the Jetson Manual eFlora is another online database for California plants. So I'm fortunate to, to work in a region where I have access to these pretty comprehensive online databases where I can populate this information. And I'm gonna mention a few others that are more broadly distributed throughout the US from where I've um, drawn some of this information. So I think that is important to consider when you're designing your species list and looking at trait values, which we'll be talking about 
um, in the second half of the workshop is making sure that you're including species that you can actually populate and have and compile information on from databases or other sources as well. Great, that's it for now. Awesome, great questions so far. Okay, so we're gonna shift gears. I've been talking a lot. I wanna take a break. I wanna hear from you guys. So we are going to do a breakout group activity. So hopefully you all have downloaded that worksheet from the box folder. Um, if you have not, please just write in the chat and we can send that link out again. Um, so in this activity, we're going to brainstorm climate vulnerabilities to riparian vegetation. Um, and you can also brainstorm vulnerabilities to other riparian restoration goals or targets that you have that are influenced by a healthy riparian plant community. So we're gonna use these vulnerabilities later on to identify plant trait values um, for a planting palette tool. So in terms of our directions, um, make sure you have that worksheet available um, in Word, Word documents. And first on your own, I want you to spend three minutes to brainstorm at least one climate vulnerability to riparian vegetation or wildlife habitat or another goal that you might have for a project. After your three minutes are up, we're going to split into breakout group rooms. Once you're in your room, you're going to introduce yourself and each share out one of the vulnerabilities that you came up with. And if you have extra time in your group, you can also brainstorm additional climate vulnerabilities together. If you have a question during your breakout group, you should be able to click on the ask for help button and I will be able to join you and I'll try and pop into every breakout group as I can to answer any questions. So once we finish our breakout groups, we will reconvene as a full group and we can share out some takeaways in the chat box. So are there any questions about these activity directions before we start? Okay, it sounds like not. So I'm gonna start the clock for three minutes. So let's spend three minutes on your own with that worksheet, brainstorming some climate vulnerabilities. And then we'll get the breakout group set up. So you have until 12.03 my time, which would be 1.03 your time. So I hope you guys had uh, good conversations in your breakout group rooms. We'll reconvene those rooms in just a bit here. Um, if you have any more comments or takeaways you'd like to share with everybody, please uh, add those to the chat box. Um, so I think, you know, I popped into a few groups and it sounded like people were really diving into this idea of these trait values and other strategies. So we'll um, dive into that now and we'll have more time to talk about it. Um, so once you've got this list of climate vulnerabilities, we can focus on increasing the adaptive capacity of our ecological communities by Collecting plants um, and, and a plant community really with certain traits that are responsive to our vulnerabilities. So um, the next step here in developing these tools is to select and evaluate plant trait values that can help address climate vulnerabilities and also reach other project goals. Um, so I would recommend consulting online databases to help identify possible traits um, and trait values. Um, and the idea here is it's really helpful to be consistent with how you're defining traits and evaluating whether a plant has that trait or not. So the USDA plants database uh, is one that I use heavily. It's got a lot of really good information on different species profiles across the US. Another good source is the US Forest Service's fire effects information system. Talks a lot about fire, but it also has really good uh, comprehensive species portfolios, especially for shrubs and trees. So these are just a few example databases that you can use to help um, think through what your trait values might be. And so I wanted to give more examples of what we mean by trait values and the ones that we generated in particular for our Sierra Meadow planting palette tool. So the way that I organized my planting palette tool was I came up with um, five trait categories, a definition of what I meant by traits that fit within that category. And then I populated each category with a number of different traits. So for species persistence, 
uh, I looked for traits that could increase plant survival under a changing climate. Example of that could be flood tolerance. Another category I had was disturbance resilience. So these refer to traits that help species recover after disturbance events. So an, an example trait I put here was um, rhizomatous species that could um, have really dense below ground roots and could create shoots after perhaps there was a disturbance event on the surface, such as a fire, um, potentially these species could re-sprout. For wildlife support traits, I was looking at traits that could help support food webs, pollination, and wildlife species. So this is where it kind of is both climate related and also trying to think through providing traits that can meet other project goals. So an example trait here could be insectary plants that are providing nectar or are a host plant for insect species. For ecosystem processes traits, um, these are traits that regulate and support ecosystem processes, um, such as species that are really good at stabilizing stream banks and helping to reduce erosion. And I also included cultural ecosystem services traits in my planting palette to address these, um, the, the type of ethnobotanical species we might want to include for um, indigenous peoples as well. So I'm going to pull up my planting palette user guide to show you an example of this. So go down here. So within my user guide for this tool, I have an appendix that has all of the plant trait definitions in it. So I've got my category, and then underneath that category, I have these different um, trait values. And I include the rationale for why I chose that trait, such as what the climate vulnerabilities were, or restoration goals that triggered having that uh, be an important trait to represent. And then I've included the definition of what I actually mean by that trait value. So in this case, for drought tolerance, I use definitions from that USDA plants database I mentioned earlier. And so then if we go into my planting palette tool and I click on this, we already saw this plant selection tab. Um, and if I go to the species traits tab, Across the top here, I've got all of my different trait values and then the value for each of these species here. So, got just species persistence, disturbance, wildlife support. And then I've also included resource phenology of when these species are flowering or producing, producing seeds and flowers, uh, seeds and fruit rather. And then I've got all these other traits listed here. So give you an example of what it looks like um, in practice of, of these different trait values. So now is a part where we think about linking um, the climate vulnerabilities that you came up with to plant trait values. So obviously, you know, looking back to these vulnerabilities from earlier, um, one of the vulnerabilities we've talked about was this more frequent and intense drought. So obviously a plant trait value for that that could be responsive to that is um, drought tolerance of a plant. Um, it could also include tolerance, tolerance to seasonally dry conditions. So maybe it's okay in dry conditions for a few weeks, but not over long periods of time. For this idea of this mismatch, a uh, phenological mismatch between the timing of resource availability and wildlife, like that example I gave with the hummingbird, um, one plant trait value that we've incorporated into our tools is resource phenology, that bloom period that I just showed in that spreadsheet briefly. So trying to capture when species are flowering, when they're providing fruit, so that we can try and plant species that might be providing fruit and flowers throughout the year. So there's a lot of complementarity that we're looking for when we're using these tools to develop our design. We want to look at a suite a community of species that are going to do well together um, to provide these different trait values. So in our next breakout group activity, um, I think some of you have already done some of this already, um, but within our breakout group, we want to go through those climate vulnerabilities that you discussed previously and brainstorm any plant traits that could help address those vulnerabilities. Um, you can also, like this can be really open if you have thoughts about any other trait values that might help reach your restoration goals, please discuss those as well. And if you have ideas about restoration strategies that could help reduce vulnerabilities, such as 
where you plant or how you plant these species or where you're sourcing the species from, um, feel free to discuss those elements as well. So I'm gonna give us actually just 10 minutes in this breakout group since we're running, time is quickly running out. So we'll do 10 minutes in the group and then um, we'll come back and reconvene for the last part of the session. Um, so we'll go ahead and join our breakout group. If you want to share out any takeaways um, from things that you spoke about in your group into the chat box so everybody could see, that would be great. And I'm just going to go through a few more slides and then open it up for any more questions. So the final thing I wanted to talk about today was how you can use a tool like this to craft a planting list for your restoration site. Um, so the steps that we recommend um, is to first develop an initial species list of species you might want to include in your planting design. So you could consult local experts or botanists to create a site appropriate planting list. Um, you could actually go out and see what plants are persisting at your site or in nearby reference sites to get an idea of what plants you might want to include in your design. And then this is where you take that list and you can actually go into your tool and assess the traits of the species that you've selected. And at that point, you might also realize that you've missed a few species that you think are important to include, and you can actually add those to your um, planting palette tool as well. So you can use the tool to evaluate um, the species you've selected and see which traits are represented by your planting design. And ideally, you want to uh, ensure that each of the traits you have in your planting palette tool are represented by at least one or more species. So the idea here is that you have a mix of species. You're thinking about the whole community, ecological plant community, and thinking about including these diverse species that have a mix of traits that, as that together, will help them persist, recruit, and function under current and future conditions. So this concept really has to do with building ecological insurance. So before I go into a demo of the planting palette tool to show, show how this works in practice, I wanted to talk about how we actually select species. And so uh, at Point Blue, one of the things we talk about a lot is building ecological insurance. So ideally your planting design will have each of your trait values represented by more than one species. And the reason we encourage you to do this is because if you only have one species providing fruit for wildlife or one species that's fire adapted, as the climate changes or the site conditions change, maybe those species don't do as well. Maybe they uh, don't persist at the site. So if you only have one species representing that trait value and that species uh, goes away, you don't, you have this gap in your ecological community that you don't have another plant that is fulfilling that function. But if you're really focused on increasing biodiversity and making sure that you do have multiple species representing these different trait values, um, even if one species doesn't do as well, hopefully you have other species in place that can provide those same functions. So we actually did a project in Marin County, California, where we compared a traditional design of a planting palette that a consultant we work with pretty regularly came up for us. And then we also did use our planting palette tool for Marin County to develop a climate smart planting palette where we're trying to increase um, the number of species representing each trait value. And so as you can see, there's just so much more redundancy in our climate smart model. We're including a lot more species than in the traditional design. So I am going to pull up the planting palette tool and give a little demo of how this trait evaluation works. So the way that I set up my planting palette tool is the first tab has to do with plant selection. So I've actually got this column here and a value of one means that I want to include this species in my planting palette design and a value of zero means I'm excluding it. So the other day I went through and I kind of marked a few species that I might want to include in a planting design. So now that I have these species marked off, I've uh, created this Climate Smart Performance tab and it actually generates graphs for me um, that shows the distribution of trait values for the species I've selected. 
So rather than trying to go through my species trait tab and try and look at the species distribution uh, based on these trait values, I've got Excel set up so it'll do it for me and it'll generate these graphs. So I have drought tolerance here. I see how many of my forbs and grasses and shrubs have different levels of drought tolerance. And then I also have these other trait values around wet conditions, flood tolerance, fire tolerance, then I also have this resource phenology tab that shows how many species are blooming in a given month. So each colored bar is a different month of the year. And the bars represent how many species in my design are flowering or fruiting during that month. So I can use this to evaluate and say to myself, do I have all of my traits represented by at least one species? Are there places where I can increase redundancy and find additional species? that I can add in to complement this design. Um, so, for example, if I'm looking at drought tolerance here, I notice that I only have one shrub here that has high drought tolerance. So, I can take that information and I can go to my species traits tab and I can try and sort this so that I'm looking at shrubs and trees that have high drought tolerance. And so I see that this blue elder elderberry um, is a species that is a shrub and it's got high drought tolerance. So I can add that to my list of species that I want to include in my planting design. So in this way, you can um, assess your planting design before you do it. And you can see if there's any opportunities to add in additional species. So I know we're running out of time here, so I'm gonna, take a break now and open it up for any remaining questions that people might have. Thank you for all bearing with us as we power through all this information and content. Thanks, Marian. That was really good to see how that plays out in the example that you provided. Um, uh, one of the questions that we have is, Marian, do you ever use non-native species in your list if they fill a functional niche? That is an interesting question. Uh, no, we have not done that yet. So that is an interesting question with a lot of pros and cons. So if other people have done that in their projects, we'd love to hear from you in the chat box. Um, it looks like uh, there's an add-on comment from Gabe that says, one thing we discussed were options for areas that are already on the low end for precipitation, um, e.g. eight to 10 inches. It's hard to bump down to drier drier ecosystems to find drought tolerant and competitive plants, which leads to the question about using non-natives or plants that are native to other regions, such as say catalpa or desert willow. Okay, yeah, um, that brings up questions around like assisted migration and things as well. Um, and so I, just to speak to that a little bit, um, one thing that we've been experimenting with, we have a research project uh, around drought tolerant oaks. And so we've been experimenting with bringing oaks that um, we marked during the California drought in Southern California. We looked at which drought, which tree individuals were persisting under those drought conditions. And we collected acorns and we're actually growing them out um, in other areas of California to see how they're doing and whether we could actually be transplanting these oaks um, to these sites where they might actually confer some of that drought resilience. So is not quite assisted migration because it's all within the range of the species, but we are trying to introduce genetic material from other parts of that species range. So there's a lot of experimentation and monitoring that um, we're trying to do around those questions of moving species around and thinking through what we mean by native or not native too. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, another question is look, um, looking for more general species than cottonwoods that require sandbars and inundation for germination. So that's kind of a detailed question specific to kind of like a particular project, but do you have any thoughts yeah, on I that? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, like resources like the USDA plants database and that fire effect information system, they have a lot of species profiles for shrubs and trees, especially the fire effect database. Um, so, yeah, I'd recommend kind of poking around. You could also ask, I don't know if you're a botanist or not, but if you know botanists, you can ask people as well um, those types of questions. So take advantage of your network. And there are a lot of databases out there online that can help filter through different species. So that's what I've drawn on a lot. 
to try and diversify my plant species list. Do you have um, a place where you uh, keep a compendium of resources that you could share or? Um, yeah, so my recommendation there would be to um, look at the user guide for the Sierra Meadow planting palette tool. And I've got, you know, a, you know, the lit cited basically has all those databases and I've included where I've gotten those trait values for each species. And I've also included a table in there. You know, I can just share my screen and show you. Um, beauty of technology, right? Okay. So let's see. Yeah, so for each of these trait values, um, I've included where I've gotten the information from. And then I have a table up front here. Um, this is probably more relevant to people working in the Sierra, but I've got a list of all the literature sources that I consulted to identify the Sierra Meadow plants for inclusion. So I did talk to botanists, but I did look at like a lot of different literature papers to try and develop my list. So recommend looking there. And then also there should be, yeah, references page here that has all these different databases. So that would be a good place to start. Um, and I've got a few databases here listed as well around plant propagation and material sourcing. So yeah, look at the user guide for this planting palette tool and some of the other ones that Point Blue has developed. Um, there should be some good resources in there as well. Great, thank you. And I noticed some people entered a couple of resources in this chat box as well. Oh great, um, yeah, I want to see those. We have one more question, and while you are answering that, I will launch our final polls. Um, the question is, do you have recommendations of types of plants to use in different severity burn areas? Oh, that is a good question. I don't have any off the top of my head. Um, I don't really work in forests and wildfire areas. Um, I'm sorry, if other people in the audience have suggestions, that would be really great to see. And thank you all for joining as well today. Um, I just want to mention too that uh, Resources Legacy Fund has provided me with funding to do workshops like these. So I just want to acknowledge them that made it possible for me to join today. And I know that um, you know you have you're all pretty busy, so I really appreciate you taking the time to join today. And feel free to email me if you have any more questions. Um, I'll put my email in the chat box. And thanks for filling out all these polls just so we get a sense of how we're doing. And I see a comment. I loved all of your beautiful flower pictures. Thank you. I took those all myself. I love looking at plants. So it was a great, great excuse for me to share some of those out. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, yes. I see you included your email here. Okay. Um, there's the first poll there. And I will share the results. 